Welcome to today's video. We're going to see three topics in this video. The first one is the existence of the Fourier series, understand a little bit more where the Fourier series exists. This is not something that you're going to be doing in exercises, but more something about understanding a little bit more when the Fourier series exists. Then we're going to talk a little bit about something called the Gibbs phenomenon. Very interesting thing. We've seen actually the Gibbs phenomenon in action, even though we haven't talked about it, when we saw the example of a Fourier, partial Fourier sum in the computer. Okay, and finally, we're gonna learn how to sum. I know that that's something that you probably learned in primary school, but now that you know Fourier series, we're gonna revisit how to sum. <laughs> All right. So let's begin with the existence of the Fourier series. Uh, Fourier, remember, Fourier himself did not prove the claim about the Fourier series. He said, "Well, that is what it is. I don't know if the series converges, but when it does, this is what it is." Now, there were other people after Fourier, did it say one of them, uh, there are others, there are others, again, with the, the math that you're going to see in your, in your degree, it's really not enough to get to the level that we're going to get here, uh, to understand the proof of uh, this theorem, but um, the, uh, definitely, it's enough to understand the conditions that we're going to talk about. Now, this is not the most powerful theorem about the existence of the Fourier series, this only gives sufficient conditions for existence. Um, but again, those more advanced problems, uh, theorems, you may actually see in your signal, I suppose that you may see in your signal processing courses. Uh, and if not, uh, you can find them after seeing those courses, but uh, a little bit of a warning, they get into the realm of functional analysis. Okay, so a little bit more advanced math than the math that you're going to see. But not the math that you cannot understand, it's certainly within grasp, it's just outside of the scope of the courses that you're going to see at least in your degree, unless you take pure math courses. All right, so let's review the theorem by Dirichlet here. So Dirichlet sets out four conditions. We're gonna analyze those conditions, so don't worry. Uh, it set, sets out four conditions uh, for the Fourier series to exist. Now Dirichlet said, well, if those conditions are satisfied, then the Fourier series is point-wise convergent we will analyze a little bit better what point-wise convergence means, because it's a notion that you probably haven't seen. And it converges to the function at any point when the function is continuous, and then the average between the lateral limits at the points where there are just discontinuities. All right. What is the notion of point-wise convergence? So let me just introduce it very roughly, okay? Uh, and uh, when we talk about convergence of sums of series, right, or sequences, we talk about them into different notions in math, usually. One is point-wise convergence, and the other one is called uniform convergence. Now, I'm not gonna talk about uniform convergence. Uniform convergence is more powerful, stronger than uniform convergence. Let's see what point-wise convergence, convergence means. So, if I have a sequence of functions, f of fn, so this is a sequence of functions. Remember, I don't know, for example, we've seen already that when we define the delta, f of n equals, uh, of, of f, f n t, for example, it's equal to t to the n. Well, that's a sequence of functions, and the elements of the sequence are one, t, t squared, t cubed, right? Different values of n, n equals, n equals zero. One, two, three, okay? So if you have any sequence of functions, we say that, f of n is point-wise conversion to a function, a function, f, if, and not only if, the limit of when n goes to infinity of f n of t is equal to f of t. That's what we call point-wise convergence. So at every point, the sequence of functions converges to the value of the function f. What is the difference with uniform convergence? We're very roughly speaking. Here we do not, we do not say um, how that the whole function is getting more and more similar to the original function. All that we're saying is that the value at every point is the same. Uniform convergence is more about the distance between the two functions. <laughs> uh, uh, gets reduced kind of simultaneously in a way. It gets reduced as the limit goes to infinity. Uh, the distance between the two functions taking an average between the difference of the two functions at every point and taking the maximum possible distance and so on. 
The notion, if you want to know more about the notion of uniform convergence versus point-wise convergence, convergence, there's plenty out there that you can look for. Uh, and above all, you can come to the review session and ask your questions, all right? It, again, goes beyond the, scopes of the uh, scope of this course. You're not gonna be asked about it in assignments, but uh, it's, it's good to know that these things exist. I think the notion of point-wise point convergence is easier. It means that, yeah, the function, the limit goes to infinity, of the function at a point t goes to some function f of t. All right. In our context, what does that mean? Well, in the context of Fourier series, when we say point-wise convergence, we talk about the partial sums of the Fourier series. So let me erase and write something else. All right. So uh, in the when we define a Fourier series of a function, if you remember, we had that one, the Fourier series of the function. The only difference is that the sum goes to infinity, not to n. So I define here the partial sums. When I actually crop the sum, as we did in the computer when we uh, added uh, all the terms of the Fourier series for a particular function, then uh, we see right, that this definition with an n here means that I'm only summing up to n values. Well, in this case, being point-wise point convergent, the Fourier series is point-wise convergent to f of t, would mean that the limit in which capital N goes to infinity of f n of t corresponds to f of t at that point, right? That is, uh, that is the point-wise convergence of the Fourier series. That is guaranteed by the theorem. All right, hopefully that the notion of point-wise convergence is understood. Let's see where it, to what it converges here, and then we will analyze separately these four conditions, all right? Let's do that first. So the condition one here, basically it's telling you that the function has to be periodic. So for the Fourier series to be guaranteed to exist under this theorem, then we need the function f of, f of t to be periodic. Now, of course, uh, remember that we can compute the Fourier series representation for any function in an interval. But how did we do it if the function was not periodic? Well, what we did is create the different periodic extensions. We created what we call the full range extension or the periodic extension as well. We created the even extension and the odd extension all of those are periodic functions. So we first construct auxiliary functions that are periodic, that coincide with your function in a desired interval. And then after that, uh, then we compute the Fourier series. All right, so we, it makes sense that we need the function to be periodic for the Fourier series to work. All right, that condition is basically one. F of t plus t equals f of t is precisely saying the function has to be periodic. All right, let's understand the second one. Piecewise continuity, which is what 2 requires, 2 requires that f of t is piecewise continuous over a period. What does that mean? Well, it means that uh, the function has to be continuous except for perhaps a finite number of jump discontinuities. We tolerate, we tolerate uh, jump discontinuities as many as you want, as long as there's a finite number of them. There could be a million, yes. There could be a thousand, yes. There could be a trillion, yes but a finite number of them, and all of them jump discontinuities, okay? So yeah, we need the function to be made of chunks that are continuous, uh, joined by jump discontinuities, okay? So that hopefully is, uh, is good enough. So for example, uh, if we have this, this periodic function, I don't know, something like this, and then repeat like that, and then repeat like that. Imagine this function, this is periodic, and a period is this. Well, this function is not continuous in one period, but it's made of two pieces that are continuous. It's piecewise continuous, there's only one jump discontinuity there. Okay? All right. Oh, and of course, this is condition two, not condition one. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, let's talk about condition three. Okay, uh, requirement number three. We need a finite number of maximum and maximum and minima. So what is this? Well, if you compute, for example, the function I don't know, sine of x, right? Sine of x is like that, one period is like that, so you get a maximum and a minimum in a period. However, let's think of the function, first the function f of t, sine of one over t minus two. That function alone. What is that function like? Well, uh, let's plot it. So we have something funny happening at t equals two, okay? And uh, what happens, let's see. When t goes to infinity, this goes to the sign of zero, which is zero. So at infinity is zero. Now, as I get closer to t equals minus two, the sign is going higher and higher, the sign of 
it, you know, it goes through one period, to start, so one, one oscillation of the sign, two oscillations of the sign, you see, because in the end, at t close to minus two, this is a huge number. So you don't have a lot of oscillations together. If I plot this, I get something like this. So let's try to do it like that. So it doesn't do any oscillations until it gets like close here and then accumulates, oh my God, accumulates a lot of oscillations around here, right? And then on the, on the other hand, on the other side also, a lot of oscillations and then goes down like that, back to zero and minus infinity. That's the function, even though I draw like uh, like shit, uh, but you see what I mean, right? There's here one and one, and that oscillates a lot when it gets close to t equals two, because the sign is growing, 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 and the sign is a periodic function, right? The sign of, you get the sign of pi, sign of two pi, sign of three pi, sign of four pi, pi pi, six pi, and all that, very, very close to two. It goes to almost infinite pi, as you see, when t is equal to two, it does all the oscillations possible. Now, this function is not periodic, but we can make it periodic by saying, oh, I want the periodic extension of this from zero to four. So from zero, say to four. So if I do that, then I'm gonna have, again, the same function, they say it's periodic, so I just repeat it. So I get the same function, woo, with a lot of oscillations here, and then woo, down, and so on, so on, repeating that. At every period, though, this thing has an infinite number of maxima and minima. <laughs> This function, this innocent function, sine of one over t minus two, is not so innocent. And you would say, oh, but then doesn't it go to infinity or something? It doesn't. The sine is a bounded function. The, we're gonna talk about boundedness in the next condition, right? The sine here is always minus one or one maximum tops. Doesn't go beyond one and minus one. So this thing is not going to infinity at t equals two. It's not doing that. It's between minus one and minus one, but the limit does not really exist. It's infinitely oscillatory when you get close to t equals two. So you see, there are very ill functions that are really simple, like this one. This is super simple, and yet it's extremely ill, right? Have you ever faced a function like that? <laughs> so it's zero and infinity, and then when it gets uh, close to two, does a maximum, and then a minimum, and then a lot of an infinite number of maxima and minima. Infinite. The sign. You go, you cycle over all the values possible for the sign. You do infinite in the circle, you're going like to infinite angle, going like that. So if minus one, one minus one, one minus one, one minus one, one, infinite times when you, until you reach two. And then from two below, again, infinite times, and then less, 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 and then it doesn't oscillate anymore, and then it goes to zero uh, from the negative part when it goes to t equals minus infinity. Wow. <laughs> again, I don't know if you've ever seen this function, but it's pretty simple, isn't it? It's just extremely ill in here, but doesn't go to infinity. Not everything in a function that is ill is something that goes to infinity. <laughs> uh, in a way, right? Because uh, in the complex plane, if I let t go to the complex plane, if I look in the complex plane, right, there are some functions that are really well behaved in the real line, but then when you peek in the complex plane, they're monsters. They just hide all the dead bodies in the complex plane. Uh, because the sign, when you look in the complex plane, right, if t is imaginary, the sign of something imaginary is an exponential function. Remember, uh, the sign of x was equal to e to the i x minus e to the minus i x divided by 2i. If x is imaginary, so if I get i x, then this thing becomes a sum of exponentials. An exponential of 1 over t minus 2 when t is equal to 2 is very ill, and you can tell that is the, um, the exponential of infinity in a way is divergent, right? In the complex plane is divergent. So you don't see that divergence. The thing in the real line is very well, um, very well uh, behaved in terms of not going to infinity. Now it's not well behaved at all, right? But it doesn't go to infinity, it doesn't diverge. Instead, it does an infinite number of oscillations close to 2. Very ill function, very ill, and very simple, and very ill at the same time. Anyway, so yeah, having a final number of maximum and minimum, this function would satisfy every other condition except for three. <laughs> three is not satisfied, and this thing doesn't have a Fourier series. <laughs> All right, let's see number four. Number four is simpler. All right, boundedness. So it requires that the function is bounded, which means that the function, the absolute value of the function is below some positive value for all values of t. What does that mean? Well, it means that I have the plot of the function and there is some value of m that I can write a horizontal line at m units and a horizontal line at minus m units 
and the function is between the two lines. It never goes over. That's what it means about this. What if I have a function that does that? Well, if I have a function that does that, right? Imagine. Well, then I pick a different M. My M is not that one. It's an M over here. But still, there is an M. There is some M. doesn't have to be the same M for all of them. There is some M. So that the function is within the horizontal lines. That's what it means to be bounded. So again, it doesn't go to infinity anywhere. That's another way of saying it in a more rough way. The function doesn't really go to infinity at some t. It's within two bounds. All right, those are the four conditions. Uh, let's see what happens with the convergence then. So again, the four conditions guarantee that if all those four conditions are satisfied, you are periodic. Your piecewise continues, you're bounded, you don't diverge, and also you don't have any kind of that ill behavior of having an infinite number of maximum and minima in a period, then you're guaranteed to have a Fourier series that converges. That's most functions, right? <laughs> that you know. All right, let's see about the convergence. So, uh, we have here an example that we've done in class. We computed the Fourier series for this periodic function. This periodic function is the one that I put here. It's uh, the second example that we did in class, if you remember. This one, in class, okay? You know what I mean. So this function uh, is periodic, and it's certainly piecewise continuous. It certainly has a finite number of maxima and minima. Uh, in fact, uh, by that is say that there's no maxima and minima in this sense, all the points are degenerate. There is a constant function, right? So in that case, we say that there's no maximum or minimum, the function is constant. You could have said that all points are maximum, but that's not the way we do maximum and minimum, okay? Uh, you see, technically, all the derivatives are zero everywhere here, but also the second derivative, third derivative, and fourth derivative is constant, okay? So that's not a maximum or a minimum. Anyway, so it's a constant function. And then f of t is also bounded, but it's bounded by one plus epsilon, if you want, right? So by two. Maybe or three. If I put three, or even two, of course, a one plus one, uh, contains the function in between two horizontal lines. All right, so it satisfies the four conditions of the Lipschitz layers theorem. Now, that tells me that the function, the series, this series, converges to this function, right, at every point. But, but, what happens at a discontinuity? For example, if I ask, what is f of t uh, f of t at uh, t equals uh, let's say uh, I don't know uh, for example here at zero all right if I ask, ask what's the value at uh, zero okay then uh, what will you say now here it tells me zero otherwise so if I just check out the function let's call this one f for Fourier series just to distinguish with the notation if you check out the function, you say, well, it's zero otherwise, right? And this is strictly less. So yeah, that thing would be zero looking at the function. Okay. What is the value of the Fourier series though? The Fourier series at zero, okay, we're in a discontinuity. So the function is zero from the left and one from the right. So this thing is equal to the, the one over two f of zero minus, plus f of zero plus. And what is that? Well, it's one and zero, so zero minus is zero. Zero plus is one, so this thing is one over two. So the Fourier series does not go, when there's a discontinuity like that, does not go to one or the other. The Fourier series goes to one half, which makes sense, right? Because this is how come, and then, and then this is gonna connect with the Gibbs phenomenon. How can we approximate a function that is discontinuous by a sum of always continuous functions? You see what I mean? It's difficult, it's a difficulty. Um, the functions are continuous, they don't suddenly disappear from existence and become discontinuous. So it's kind of like, well, it needs to go at least in one point, it needs to have some value in between, in a way. I mean, just roughly talking about it, right? And that is why, remember when I told you about the heavy side? And we said the heavy side is one for t larger or equal than, than zero and zero for the rest. Uh, and then we said, well, there's a convention, you can actually do it zero for t uh, less or equal than zero and then one for larger than strictly. Well, the right definition of the heavy side 
And by right, I mean not the one that we use in the course, but the one that is equal to this Fourier series, is theta, right, of t would be equal to one for t larger than zero, zero for t less than zero, and one over two for t equals zero. That means that would be that the theta of t would coincide with its Fourier series representation around zero. And there are reasons in math to do that when you talk about distributions, distribution theory, measure theory. So this is probably a better theta than the one that we used ourselves. But we haven't used this one. We haven't used from zero to one. It doesn't really matter as much, okay, for us. But when we do, and in fact, if we use this one for our results, our results, all of them carry the same way we had them before. Because remember, we use them within integrals. And within integrals, one point is nothing. If you remove one point from an integral, the integral doesn't change. Okay, but then again, the one half here, when you see this definition that often you will see in more mathy uh, uh, texts, then uh, the reason why they put a one half here is because they want it to be exactly equal to the Fourier series at all points of function. And a discontinuous function, well, in the discontinuities, the series, again, the series, where does the series converge? Well, I don't know. It can convert to one or the other, well, to the average. It cannot make sense. The series converts to the average between the two points in the discontinuity. All right, let's talk about the Gibbs phenomenon. Remember when we did in the computer uh, the partial sums of the Fourier series to see, to convince you that the Fourier series really converts to the function we were actually wanting it to converge? So if you remember that, then you would remember that we had a function like this one, but it was minus pi over four here, pi over four here, and it was a step like that, a top hat, right? And this function, we saw that when we sum, when this is the partial Fourier series, right, with a, a capital N in here instead of infinity, we sum one, and one of them was like, like this, right? It was like a, ooh, like that, right? Kind of, and then not see like that. Then we added more, and the thing was starting to look more like, ooh, 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 it was actually getting the shape of this. And then when we added about a thousand or more, we got the following. We got this thing, uh, right? A horn here, like that. Horn, I'm exaggerating the horns a bit, like that. So, those horns, <laughs> we're gonna talk about the Gibbs phenomenon. Uh, right, when I, this is super interesting because it's true that the function was gets closer and closer. In fact, when I sum 10,000, if you remember, it looked like, like the top hat with two small, really small horns here, right? Two horns there, two very thin, by a small, I mean thin, and then really look like the function, right, with 10,000. The Gibbs phenomenon, and I'm not gonna get into the math because the math is relatively complicated, it's related to this uniform convergence thing. It's uh, related to the fact precisely that the convergence is point-wise, not uniform. <laughs> so anyway, let me just uh, elaborate on that. Now, uh, at every point, so uh, one thing is true. If I sum the infinite number of summands in here, all of them, I get this function with one half in here, but this function, the square. I do get the square, I don't get horns, I don't get uh, inaccuracies. The Fourier series does represent exactly the value of the function at every point. Now, when we're trying to approximate in a way or to represent any discontinuous function as a finite number of continuous functions, there is no way that I can approximate it with a finite number. I will always make a mistake when I get close to the discontinuity. So let me put it like that. This horn, if we zoom in, or let me just zoom in into the horn, right? Let's zoom in. What happens here is that we have the function here does grows like this and then shoots a bit and then goes down, right? That's the horn. I'm just zooming into the horn. That's kind of what the horn will do. Uh, right, so the function should be like that. Let's do it like this, right? There. Function should be like that, but instead does this horn. The convergence, so if, if the function was uniformly convergent, when I take the limit of n going to infinity, this horn should go down go down, go down, and disappear in the limit. But that's not the, it does disappear in the limit, but it, not dis it doesn't disappear by going down. What happens is that it's displaced to the left. So this horn is thin. As I add more terms, the next iteration gives me a horn like this. 
like that, equally high, but dies earlier. And then another one equally high, but dies earlier. Equally high, but dies earlier. In the limit, it's infinitely thin, so it disappears in the limit. But always, for any finite number of terms, no matter how high, I'm gonna get a little horn. Thinner and thinner and thinner, but a horn nevertheless. There's always gonna be points there that are gonna be far from the function until I sum the infinite number of them. Summing more does not make the horn go down, makes it thinner. See what I mean? So that's called the Gibbs phenomenon. And it's interesting because when it was first observed, people thought that it was inaccuracies in the apparatuses they were using to represent them. They were using oscilloscopes, uh, even with the computer, right? It's easy to believe that, yeah, those are numerical inaccuracies of the computer. No, 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 that's a real thing. The function does not converge uniformly. Physicists, when they saw it, they thought, oh, it's an inaccuracy in our apparatus. No, not really, no. It's not an inaccuracy. It's the fact that this, this form will never disappear. No finite number, finite sum of continuous functions will ever be able to reproduce a discontinuous function. Now, an infinite sum does. In the limit, this is super important. It's not that there's always an error. That's not true. If you sum the infinite number of them, there's no error. And uh, for a fixed point demand here, adding more makes it better because it displaces the horn to the left always. But the horn doesn't reduce in height. If it reduces in height, that would be uniform convergence, as we talked about. It's not uniformly convergence. It's a point-wise convergence, which means that, yeah, the way it does it is that it's always a high horn here, but it becomes thinner and thinner and thinner and the limit disappears because it's infinitely thin. All right, and that's called the Gibbs phenomenon. If you have any questions about this, this is more learning about it. Keep in mind, this is about learning, not about solving exercises that you would be examined on, but increasing your knowledge of Fourier analysis and signal processing, okay? Take it like that. And math, of course. Uh, again, this is very rough to learn about these things properly. If you're interested in that, you should take pure math courses. I would recommend you take analysis, and real analysis, complex analysis, and then uh, functional analysis, all right? Um, but anyway, this is our recommendation for those of you that are into pure math. It's certainly not a necessary thing at all, and certainly it strays from the path of an electrical engineer. I am a mathematical physicist, so I like this stuff, <laughs> but not necessarily everyone has to like this stuff. In any case, at least you know it, and I hope that you find it interesting. These are interesting things that are not just math, they reflect on nature. You will do oscilloscopes, and you will have partial Fourier series, because you cannot contain all the possible frequencies there are in cables that are omniac, right? So, in any case, um, I hope that the, look, what is the phenomenon is clear. Let's do a more applied exercise now, which is something that is useful in engineering. It's useful in science, in physics, in biology. It's useful in kindergarten, right? It's learning how to sum, all right? So let's see a little bit about that now that we know about Fourier analysis. Uh, well, not Fourier analysis, Fourier series, okay? Let's do it. All right, so we're gonna do uh, we're going to learn how to add and subtract. Well, in particular, an, an addition here we're going to say. Also, there are subtractions in here. But it's a sum of numbers, and this sum of numbers, we're going to evaluate it. This is actually written in the same form that you would find exercises, right? Typically, I will ask you about a sum, and I will tell you using this function as a two. So let's see how. So this sum is 1 minus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 5 minus 1 over 7. You see the pattern, right? So the next one would be was 1 over 9 minus etc, right? So this function I can summarize as the sum n equals 0 to infinity, okay? Uh, n equals 0 to infinity of uh, minus 1 to the n divided by 2n plus 1. It's important that you know how to write this series from zero to infinity, you can check that it reproduces that for sure. But it's also important that you know how to remap the dummy index of a sum. How do I do that? Well, this sum, let me just write it here, is equal to n equals one to infinity, and that, that would be two n minus one, and then here, minus one over uh, n minus one, for example. Okay, so check. These are the same thing. Let's check the summand. So here, the first one. Let's start from this one. What do I get with n is equal to zero? So I get minus one to the zero, which is one, divided by uh, two times zero is zero, divided by one, one. So my first summand is one. Oh, coincides. How about the second? 
The second is a minus because it's minus one uh, to the one, right? So minus. And the denominator is two times one plus one, so over three. Right, and then I get, again, same thing, one over five and so on. This one reproduces that. But so does this one. Let's see. First term, n equals one. n equals one is minus one to the zero. So minus one to the zero is one. And because minus one to the zero is one, I get one divided by, well, n is one, so it's two times one minus two, which is one. So my first term is one, perfect. How about the second? n for the second here is two. Minus one squared is one. Uh, sorry, two, uh, n, no, it's not two. n uh, for the second summand is, yeah, it's two. So two minus one is one, minus one to the one, minus. Divided by two times two, four, minus one, three, one over three. Okay, let's do the next one, plus. Uh, n is three now, three minus two, two. Three minus one, two, minus one squared, one. And then uh, two times three, six, minus one, five. You see, it's the same series. How do I get from one to another? Very easy, I did the change. So let me do the steps explicitly that you will never do when you learn how to do it, but maybe to understand it is good. What you do is uh, take, uh, you define an n prime, right? Uh, that is equal to n plus one, all right? And then you say, okay, cool. So that means that uh, two things. Uh, on the one hand, when n is equal to zero, then n prime is one, right? And then it also means that n is equal to n prime minus one. All right, wonderful. So in this series, I apply the change and I transform now n prime. Okay, when n was zero, n prime is one. So what? Infinity, infinity. When n is infinity, n prime is also infinity. Cool. Now, I get here minus one of n prime. Well, it's minus one. I substitute the n by n prime minus one. So n prime minus one. And I divide by two and then n prime minus one plus one substitute in here okay okay I substitute when i see an n i write an n prime minus one i simplify that denominator i get two so in the denominator this is sum n prime equals to one to infinity then minus one to n prime minus one divided by and this is two n prime and this is minus two plus one that's minus one there you go so i get this series and now the final step is to say, well, why do I call it n prime? It's a dummy variable. I can call it Joshua. Or even better, I can call it n again <laughs> and remove the prime. And this is this. That's why you can see they're equal with the change of variables. And hopefully this also adds to your intuition that it's not different if you change it. But shouldn't I write n prime? No, it's the same. It's a dummy variable. It's a dummy index in this case. If it's an integral, which is nothing but a sum, it will be a dummy variable. All right, anyway, it's important that you learn how to go from one expression of the sum to another. I could also do another simplified step as well. If I want to do another simplified step, I can do, if I want, uh, I can do things like uh, this. Sum n equals one uh, to infinity of uh, uh, minus one, n plus one, divided by 2n minus 1. Because, why? Because minus 1 to the n minus 1, it's equal to minus 1 to the n plus 1. How do I go from one to another? Well, it's easy. Multiply this one by minus 1 squared, which is a 1. Minus 1, n minus 1. And then, this is a 1. I did nothing. This is an equal sign, right? I did nothing. But then I can add the two exponents and I get minus 1, 2 plus n minus 1, which is equal to minus 1 to the n plus 1. So all these three sum expressions are the same. For our exercise, I think we're just going to need this one, okay? But I think it's good if you learn that you can change the dummy index in the sum, and it's the same expression. This sum is the same as this one, and it's the same as this one. All right? Okay. So how are we going to get this sum out of this function and how is this function in any way related <laughs> to this sum like seriously if i don't tell you probably it would be difficult maybe some of you would come up with the idea but it would be difficult i understand let's see well the key of that always is doing the fourier series of this periodic extension and comparing the fourier series with this expression that we have here our objective is to find this sum okay so i'll write it i'm gonna i'm gonna write it here uh, in much shorter terms, like that. So, uh, we want to evaluate this sum using this function. 
Step one, find the Fourier uh, series for this function that I give you. All right, so what is the period? Well, the period is clearly this. So t is equal to pi. And that means that omega, which is two pi over the period, is one, okay? So we know that the Fourier series, also what do we know? This function happens to be odd. It's not the odd extension. It's just the function happens to be odd. Well, because it's odd, we only gonna have the ends. We're gonna compute and see that we only have the ends, right? But still, you don't need to. If you see it, you can just already compute the ends. So this Fourier series, so let's, let me just write the Fourier series. So f of t, is it t or x? f of x, it's equal to a zero divided by two, plus sum n equals one to infinity, a n cosine of n omega, if you want, omega x, plus sum n equals one to infinity, bn sine n omega x, right? Uh, again, you can just directly say in this case it's only the bn's, but let's quickly prove it and then erase it. So what would be a zero? Well, a zero, if you remember, is twice over the period, and the period is two pi. Integral for the period, I'm gonna take t zero equals minus pi, from minus pi to pi, of uh, the function, well, I'm gonna write the dx here like adults, <laughs> uh, of x, right? And then we realize, oh, but in this interval, this area comes of this area, it's an odd function. So because it's odd, this is zero. And how about a n? Same thing, same thing. We have minus pi, two pi, dx, m of x, the cosine of, in this case, substituting, it would be n, uh, one, x, right? But the cosine of nx is an even function, f of x is an odd function, so even times odd results in overall odd, so this is zero over the integration interval. So indeed, then there's no a terms. So let's just erase the a terms and write the free series only with b terms. Like that. Okay, so let's compute the bn's. So if we compute the bn's, bn is, again, two over the period, integral from minus pi to pi dx f of x and in this case I'm going to write the sine of I'm going to substitute omega and x omega is one in this case all right now we realize that this function is odd this function is odd so the overall function is even nice I don't need to do two integrals I can write this as <laughs> cancel the two one over pi and then twice the integral from zero to pi Okay, of this is a constant that is one from zero to pi is one. So this thing is the integral of one times the sine of n x. All right, so this integral is immediate, and what we get is oops minus two over n pi, the n coming from the integral. All right the minus because the integral of the sine is minus cosine, and then we get the cosine of nx evaluated from zero to pi. So in other words, we get minus two n pi, and then the cosine of n pi, and minus the cosine of zero, which is one. All right, then we again realize that this thing here is minus one to the n, okay? So we get that bn's, let's just uh, write it here, bn, it's equal, let's see. When n is even, is one minus one, which is zero. And when n is odd, then it's minus one, minus one minus two, times minus two, four. Four n pi, or n odd. With these coefficients now, we can write the function f of x, and let me just write the Fourier series first, uh, symbolically. So bn, then the sine, let me substitute omega, and x. What are the summands of this sum? For n equals one, b1 sine of x, right? Plus b2 sine, uh, oh sorry, yeah, so sine of two x, right? Plus b3 sine of three x, plus b4 sine of four x, and so on. Let's separate it into even and odd. So sum n equals 
1 to infinity b 2m sine 2mx. What are the summands contained here? Well, for n equals 1, this is b2 sine of 2x. For n equals 2, this is b4 sine of 4x. For 3, it would be b6 sine of 6x, right? So these are, you know, these are the even terms, all right? The one that would go there. Even terms. And now the odd ones. The odd ones, I have two options. I could do sum n equals 1, as I've been doing so far, b 2n minus 1 sine 2n 2n minus 1 x. I could do that, and that would be correct. You see, the semantics of this is when n is equal to 1, I get b 1, right? 2 minus 1 sine of 1 x. Then when n is equal to 2, I get 4 minus 1 b 3 sine of 3x and so on. So I get the even terms, right? I could do the opposite too. I could do write a zero in here, a plus in here, a plus in here, and it's the same sum. Remember, we did it already in the example that used to be there. Okay? Let's see if it's representing the same terms. What do I get? When any, the first term here is n is equal to zero. When n is equal to zero, it's b1. Right. And then the sign of zero plus one, okay, is the sign of x. What about when n is equal to 1? I get 2 plus 1, b3, and then sine of 3x as well, and so on and so forth. So indeed, I'm getting the same terms. It's the same sum. If I start at 1, I get a minus 1 here. If I start at 0, I get a plus 1 here. Get used to that. That's important. Why do I do it like that now? And if, if, uh, if you know previous exercises, I did it with the minus. Well, because the sum we want to reproduce looks like standard 0. I could have modified that to start at 1, and then I would have used the other one. It doesn't matter. But you know, this is good that you practice because you should be able to mimic any limits by doing a change of summation index, which is a dummy index. But you see how this is right, no? These are the odd terms, these are the even terms. Wonderful. So now that we've seen that, we know that all the even terms for this case are zero. So we only have the odd ones. So what I need to compute is b to n plus one. So from here, right, b to n plus 1 is whenever I see an n, write a 2n plus 1 is 4 times 2n plus 1 pi. Okay? Alrighty, so let's write the Fourier series finally. f of x is equal to, let's take the, the factors that are not n dependent out, 4 over pi. And then sum n equals 0 to infinity of 1 over 2n plus 1 sine of 2n plus 1 x. Right. All right, so that's the Fourier series. Now, with the help of this Fourier series, can I get this sum? Well, yes. <laughs> Let's see. So, uh, this is true for all x's, right? So, this is true for all x's that are real. Right. How about I pick a particular x? So, it's also true. That means it's true if x is equal to pi over 2, right? So let's write this result for pi over 2. On the left, I get f of pi over 2. You know what? I'm going to move it up because I need the space to make it more clear. So let me just erase that line and move everything up. We did the magic of crappy editing, like that. So let's do f of pi over 2. And that will be equal to 4 over pi. And then sum n equals 0 to infinity. 1 over 2n plus 1 sine of 2n plus 1 pi over 2. All right. Now, let's analyze this term. Sine of 2n plus 1 pi over 2. What is that? But let's see, uh, when n is equal to 0, as we start here, 
when n is equal to zero, then this thing is the sign, this thing is the sign of pi over two, and this is one. When n is equal to one, this is, uh, right, this is two, and one, two plus one, three, so it's the sign of three pi over two. So this is minus one. When n is equal to two, is the sign of five pi over two, which is one. When n is equal to three, this is the sign of seven pi over two, which is minus one, and so on and so forth. Okay, you're going from you're going from the sign of this and this and this and that and that and that, so one minus one. So this thing, this expression here, is minus one to the n. Agreed? Okay. Sine of 2n plus 1 multiplied by pi over 2 is minus 1 to the n. Wonderful. So this thing is minus 1 to the power of n. Let's substitute. The left hand side, we can substitute 2. f of pi over 2, how do I evaluate it? Well, I know the value of f of x. So when x is pi over 2, pi over 2 is uh, in this interval. So f is, is here actually, so f is 1. So I know this thing is equal to one from this function, from equation one. From equation one, I know that f of pi over two is one on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, this becomes four times pi sum n equals zero to infinity. And then I get minus one to the n divided by two n plus one. Ha ha, <laughs> so, you see what I did? I, the left hand side is the f, so I evaluated the f from here because I know the result. On the right hand side, I keep the Fourier series. So, uh, wonderful. Now, if uh, this thing is exactly my s is the sum that I want. So, wonderful. One equals four s divided by pi. This is an s, not an, an, an s divided by pi. So that means that uh, the sum s is equal to pi over four. Well, look at that. <laughs> We've got, oh, let's take this rubbish out. Shoot! And then we get from here that, substituting, the sum n equals zero to infinity of minus one divided by two n plus one equals pi over four. If you ask Wolfram Alpha, to compute it for you, it will tell you it's pi over 4. If you pick a calculator and start summing all the terms, you will see how this converges to pi over 4. And there you go. We, oh, minus 1 to the n, my bad, right? So we've summed this series that in principle is difficult. I mean, you didn't learn tools to compute this series, right? Maybe in the previous class courses you learned that this is convergent. But maybe you didn't learn what it converges to. Well, there you go. This one converges to pi over 4, and we've done it using Fourier series. So certainly, Fourier series can be used to do sums. This is not the last time you're gonna see that. We're gonna recover, uh, we're gonna see that again when we see a uh, complex Fourier series and Parseval uh, theorem. This is the topic for the next video, which will be the last one on Fourier series uh, before we move to the Fourier transform, all right? So I'll see you in the next video, and I hope that you enjoy as much as these things are enjoyable and as much as my special effects are crappy and cheesy, and I know, <laughs> but I hope that at least the videos are rewarding in uh, the academic sense. <laughs> and again, I hope that if there are questions, please do come to the, the live sessions and let's discuss them. All right, see you next video.